We live in a world where many people conceive of relations between Muslims, Jews, and Christians, and other religions to be one of mutual neglect at its best, violent struggle at its worst. It's a world where the ghosts of terrorism has fostered grotesque caricatures and gross misunderstandings between faiths and cultures. In such a world, His Highness the Aga Khan reminds us of ideals of human dignity and the value of spirituality side by side with an emphasis on democratic development and pluralism. He is thus a voice of reason and spirit, a combination which some believe is impossible, but which the world needs more than ever. My government views the Aga Khan Development Network as a like-minded development actor. And we are both aware of the need for conflict mitigation. We believe in teaming up with others, and we share a common understanding that development is multifaceted and that our approach must be holistic. And finally, and I think Your Highness, you alluded to this yesterday, one of the most important characteristics of a like-minded development actor is to put the poor people first. Development is about advancing individuals and societies from poverty to opportunity and choice. This requires far-reaching political, social and economic reform. Developing countries must secure an enabling environment through provision of global policies. Non-governmental organizations have a number of important roles to fulfill in the development process. They often play a vital role as suppliers of education and health services. Faith-based organizations too. They give poor and marginalized people a voice. A voice. Poverty can never be fought top-down, and it can never be fought only bottom-up. It can only be fought both ways. In our view, the Aga Khan Network has a special ability to initiate and implement projects in a way that takes local conditions and culture as a starting point. They are skilled at including a strong local community involvement and ownership at all stages of implementation. Only in this way can the interests of the local people be taken seriously into account. In this way, we can make a contribution to development by enhancing the potential of local skills and efforts. And only by taking these seriously can we contribute to lasting results. The effective world of the future will be one of pluralism, a world that understands, <coughs> appreciates, and builds on diversity. The rejection of pluralism plays a significant role in breeding destructive conflicts from which no continent has been spared in recent decades. But pluralist societies are not accidents of history. They are a product, a product of enlightened education and continuous investment by governments and all of civil society in recognizing and celebrating the diversity of the world's peoples. Civil society organizations make a major contribution to human development, particularly when democracies are failing or have failed. For it is then that the institutions of civil society can carry, and often do carry, an added burden to help sustain improvements in quality of life. To me, therefore, the central question is why these democracies, democracies are failing, and what can the world's nations and international organizations do to sustain their competence and stability? Let me now illustrate some specific issues which I believe are contributing to this fragility. A number of countries in which we are active have opted to harness enormous resources to universal primary education, causing a significant under-expenditure on secondary and tertiary education. As long as the developed world hesitates to commit long-term investment towards education for democracy, and instead laments the issue of so-called failed states, much of the developing world will continue to face bleak prospects for democracy. And the West should not discount that an accumulation of failed democracies could be a serious threat to itself and its values, capable of causing, if not conflict, deep currents of stress.
amongst societies. And the West should not discount that an accumulation of failed democracies could be a serious threat to itself and its values, capable of causing, if not conflict, deep currents of stress amongst societies. In order to be allowed into a community, we sometimes have to compromise. Uh, and I would like to highlight gender as, as an example of that uh, compromise that sometimes has to be made. Would both of you comment, please, on how far can we compromise in order to be allowed in and do good work? One of the things development can do is destabilize communities. That is not the role of development. The role of development is to work with communities at a given point in time in ways of partnership that communities can make their own and work with. You cannot take developing societies and simply inject into those societies at a given time attitudes which are not acceptable to those societies. If your process is satisfactory, if it is successful, those societies will build on what they learn. So it's a process of working with them, not imposing visions of society which they don't understand, they don't associate with, and which ultimately, in reality, they will reach. What happens if the civil society and the face based organizations do not meet your expectations? Who holds them accountable? They are key development actors and players and the commitment they bring to bear often with very low salaries and very, very uh, tough conditions, I think, cannot be missed. I think that the guidelines for civil society organizations are a necessary starting point. The second point is who regulates or who oversees that the guidelines are being implemented. And there, there are two approaches. One is to, for governments to pass legislation. And the second one is for a forum or fora to exist for self-regulatory processes. <laughs>